Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina, and the lecture is on menopause. To download this lecture deck for free, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Ovigaine. And in that site, you can also find a 10 point quiz which you can try to answer just to test what you learned about a menopause. So, the main references for this lecture are Comprehensive Gynecology 7th edition. Chapter 14, Menopause and Care of the Mature Woman, and the North American Menopause Society Position Statements and Lecture Deck on Menopause. This is the outline for our lecture. So what is menopause? Menopause is a normal natural event defined as a final menstrual period confirmed after one year of no menstrual bleeding. So the operative phrase here would be one year of no menstrual bleeding. And it represents the Permanent cessation of menses resulting from loss of ovarian follicular function, usually due to aging. When does menopause occur? Naturally, it occurs around the average age of 51 years old. But prematurely, menopause can also happen secondary to medical interventions or surgical interventions such as when the patient undergoes total hysterectomy with bilateral oophorectomy or when the patient undergoes chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Or menopause can also occur at any time from impaired ovarian function secondary to genetic causes. The mean age of menopause for women from Western countries is around 51 to 52 years old, whereas for Asians, the mean age of onset of menopause is lower. So for the Filipinas, the mean age of onset of menopause is around 47 to 48 years old. Age of menopause is a genetically programmed event, and other factors that may affect age of menopause other than ethnicity, of course, is general health status, parity, and smoking. The initial endocrinologic change signaling the onset of menopause is decreased antimalarian hormone and ovarian inhibin B production, accompanied by by an increase in FSH. So you see here the whole spectrum of the signs and symptoms of menopause. So for early menopause or for a patient who is in her 40s to early 50s, her manifestations include hot flashes, sweating, insomnia, menstrual irregularities, or psychological symptoms. For the patient, uh, during the intermediate stage of menopause, like in her mid-50s to early 60s, her manifestations include vaginal atrophy, dyspareunia, skin atrophy, and incontinence. Now, for the late menopausal stage, that is in a patient in her late 60s to early 70s, her manifestations will include now osteoporosis, atherosclerosis, and Alzheimer's disease. Perimenopause is a term we use to describe that time around menopause, and we also call this the menopause transition. This is the most symptomatic phase for women. Clinical treatment of women in the perimenopause should address three general areas of concern. Irregular bleeding, symptoms of early menopause such as hot flashes, and the inability to conceive. For perimenopausal women, we usually just recommend short-term use of an oral contraceptive, usually 20 micrograms uh, ethylene estradiol. Induced menopause, or what we also call iatrogenic menopause, is cessation of menstruation that follows bilateral oophorectomy with or without hysterectomy, or chemotherapy or pelvic radiation therapy. Premature ovarian failure, POF, or also what we call premature ovarian insufficiency, or POI, is defined as hypergonadotropic ovarian failure occurring prior to the age of 40 years old. The possible causes of POF include genetic, enzymatic, gonadotropin defects, ovarian insults, idiopathic, and immune disorders. Immune disorders are the most common cause of premature ovarian failure.
so we will now discuss the effects of menopause on the various organ systems. First, the central nervous system. The brain is an active site for estrogen action as well as estrogen formation. Estrogen activity in the brain is mediated via estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. The hallmark feature of declining estrogen status in the brain is the hot flash or hot flash or a vasomotor episode. The terms hot flash or hot flash are used interchangeably clinically, but if you want to be very strict with the definition, the hot flash, that's flush with an A, usually refers to the acute cessation of heat, while the hot flash, that's flush with a U, or a vasomotor episode, includes changes in the early perception of this event and other skin changes, including diaphoresis. Hot flashes usually occur for two years after the onset of menopause, but in some patients, it can persist for up to 10 or more years. However, the severity of hot flashes decreases with time. The falling estrogen levels precipitate the vasomotor symptoms. So hot flashes are due to the thermoregulatory disruption with a much narrower temperature range between sweating and shivering. The difference in temperature at which shivering occurs and when sweating occurs is termed the thermoneutral zone. And this zone is wide among asymptomatic women or in women who are not yet menopausal. This zone is substantially more narrowed in symptomatic women or women who are menopausal. And this explains their vulnerability to vasomotor symptoms. This is a very nice illustration of the physiology of hot flashes. So first, there is increase in core body temperature resulting in increased skin blood flow and increase in the heart rate. Due to the reduced or narrowed thermoneutral zone, the increase in the core body temperature now gives rise to an intense feeling of heat with reddening of the upper body. So at this point, the brain mistakenly thinks that your body has become overheated and then starts a chain reaction to try to cool it down. So how does it cool it down? The body tries to cool down by sweating or dissipating the excess heat that it has generated. So in effect, your body will chill or shiver. One of the primary complaints of women with hot flashes is sleep disruption. Patients may awaken several times during the night and require a change of bedding and clothes because of diaphoresis or excessive sweating. This disturbed sleep often leads to fatigue and irritability during the day. The frequency of awakenings and hot flashes is reduced efficiently by giving estrogen treatment. Cognitive decline in postmenopausal women is related to aging as well as to estrogen deficiency. Verbal memory appears to be enhanced with estrogen. Dementia increases as women age, and the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Estrogen has a role in, in enhancing neurotransmitter function, which is primarily deficient in women with Alzheimer's disease. Estrogen use after menopause appears to decrease the likelihood of developing or delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease. However, once a woman is affected already by Alzheimer's disease, then estrogen or treatment with estrogen is unlikely to provide any benefit. Another CNS effect is mood disorders. Patients feel upset loss of control, irritable, fatigued, and experience blue moods or, or dysphoria at midlife, and this may be caused by fluctuating hormone levels or fluctuating estrogen levels that perturb immune systems transiently. Women with a history of premenstrual syndrome, significant stress, sexual dysfunction, physical inactivity, or hot flashes are more vulnerable to depressive symptoms. The most predictive factor for depression at midlife and beyond is prior history of clinical depression. Relaxation and stress reduction techniques, antidepressants, and counseling or psychotherapy are some of the options to consider 
or simple management of mood disorders. For both cognitive changes and mood disorders, early treatment with estrogen in younger women at the onset of menopause may be beneficial for cognition and mood. Later treatment, which means treatment at 65 years old or more than 10 years after onset of menopause, has no benefit and may even be detrimental. There is no benefit of estrogen or estrogen progesterone or even a worsening of cognition in women initiating hormonal therapy after age 65. This suggests that timing of initiation of hormone therapy is very, very important. Early exposure to estrogen decreased the possibility of brain damage from free radicals and also promoted maintenance of neuronal and synaptic activity. Estrogen also has a positive effect on collagen, which is an important component of bone and skin and serves as a major support tissue for the structures of the pelvis and urinary system. Estrogen therapy generally improves collagen content after menopause and improves skin thickness substantially after about two years of treatment. Reductions in collagen support and atrophy of the vaginal and urethral mucosa have been implicated. Patients often complain of incontinence and overactive bladder. For these patients, we recommend just weight loss, especially if the patient is overweight or obese. And we also recommend doing some pedal exercises, which can cure more than 50% of cases of stress and incontinence when performed regularly. Estrogen has also been shown to decrease the incidence of recurrence of UTI. Estrogen may restore bladder control among older women and may improve urge and other irritative urinary symptoms. The third organ system that is affected by menopause is the vulvovaginal skin, which manifests mainly as vulvovaginal atrophy. Vulvovaginal complaints are often associated with estrogen deficiency and with this change, an increase in sexual complaints also occurs, especially dyspareunia. Estrogen deficiency results in a thin, paler vaginal mucosa and the moisture content is low, pH increases, usually greater than 5, and the mucosa may exhibit inflammation and small cuticle. Unlike vasomotor symptoms, which abate over time, unfortunately, vaginal atrophy is typically progressive and unlikely to resolve on its own. Treatments would include regular sexual activity, lubricants and moisturizers, and local vaginal estrogen. The bones can also be affected by menopause. Estrogen deficiency can cause bone loss. Loss of trabecular bone is greater with estrogen deficiency than is loss of the cortical bone. Postmenopausal bone loss leading to osteoporosis is a substantial healthcare problem, and attainment of peak bone mass in the late second decade is key to ensuring that the subsequent loss of bone mass with aging and estrogen deficiency does not lead to early osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is defined as compromised bone strength, and this is a serious health threat for aging postmenopausal women by increasing the risk of fracture. So medically, we define osteoporosis as a bone mineral density result of a T-score less than or equal to negative 2.5. The normal uh, bone mineral density or BMD is a T-score greater than or equal to negative 1, while osteopenia is defined as a T-score between negative 1 and negative 2.5. What is the role of estrogen in the development of osteoporosis? Estrogen receptors are actually present in osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. Estrogen suppress bone turnover and maintain a certain rate of bone formation. Bone is remodeled in functional units called bone multicenter units or BMUs, where resorption and formation should be in balance. 
multiple sites of bone go through this turnover process over time. Estrogen decreases osteoclasts by increasing apoptosis of osteoclasts, thus reducing their lifespan. Estrogen antagonizes glucocorticoid-induced osteoblast apoptosis. Estrogen deficiency increases the activities of remodeling units, prolongs resorption, and shortens the phase of bone formation. It also increases osteoclast recruitment in BNUs, thus resorption outstrips formation. So how do we diagnose osteoporosis? Bone mass can be detected by a variety of radiographic methods, but it is the dual energy X-ray absorptionity scan or DEXA scan that has become the standard of care for the detection of osteopenia and osteoporosis. So by convention, we use the T-score to reflect the number of standard deviations of bone loss from the peak bone mass of a young adult. So again, um, we define osteopenia as a T-score of negative 1 to negative 2.5 standard deviations, and osteoporosis is defined as greater than negative 2.5 standard deviations. How do we monitor response to treatment of osteoporosis? Biochemical assays are available to assess bone resorption and formation in both the blood and urine. So serum markers or bone turnover markers appear to be most useful for assessing changes, and they are also useful as markers of the effectiveness of treatment. Here are some of the risk factors for osteoporosis, as mentioned in the FRAX 10-year calculator. So we have advanced age, ages 50 to 90, parental history of fragility, fracture, female gender, current to data smoking, low weight, long-term use of glucocorticoids, short height, rheumatoid arthritis, low femoral neck BMD, prior fragility fracture, alcohol intake of at least three units daily, smoking, and other causes of secondary osteoporosis. For the cardiovascular effects of menopause, women have a very low incidence of cardiovascular disease prior to menopause, but after menopause, the risk to CVD increases significantly. Coronary artery disease is the leading cause of death among postmenopausal women. Lifetime risk of death is 31% for CVD in postmenopausal women versus a 3% dying of breast cancer. Premature ovarian failure constitutes a significant risk. Increased risk of MI of 53-fold and ovarectomy before age 35 increases the risk sevenfold. So, why are postmenopausal women at risk for cardiovascular disease? This is because there is an accelerated rise in total cholesterol among postmenopausal women. And this increase in total cholesterol is explained by increases in the levels of LDLC or bad cholesterol. The oxidation of LDLC is also enhanced as are levels of very low density lipoproteins and lipoprotein A. High density lipoprotein cholesterol or HDLC or the good cholesterol trend downward with time, but these changes are small and inconsistent relative to the increases in LDLC. Blood flow in all vascular beds decreases after menopause. So the prostacyclin production decreases endothelin levels increase, and the vas vasomotor responses to acetylcholine are constricted, reflecting nitric oxide synthetase activity reduction. Most of these latter changes are due primarily to the fairly rapid reduction in estrogen levels. So the decrease in prostacyclin, increase in endothelin, and decrease in nitric oxide synthetase activity all lead to vasoconstriction. With estrogen, all these parameters improve and coronary arterial responses to acetylcholine are dilatory with a commensurate increase in blood flow. Overall, the direct vascular effects of estrogen are viewed to be as important or more important than the changes in lipid and lipoproteins after menopause. The beneficial arterial effects of estrogen may only be seen in younger postmenopausal women. 
Women with significant atherosclerosis or risk factors do not respond well to this treatment because of coronary plaque burden, which prevents estrogen action. So estrogen has no protective effect in women with established coronary disease. Hormone therapy may lead to plaque destabilization and thrombosis in some women with established coronary disease. The molecular mechanisms for this may be due to estrogen upregulating matrix metalloproteinase 9 and inhibiting its natural inhibitor within the neural area of the plaque. The resultant disruption of the gelatinous covering then leads to thrombosis. Early intervention shows benefit and late intervention with hormonal therapy is possibly harmful for the cardiovascular system. This is called the timing hypothesis, while younger women benefit, older women do not, and may endure harm. Hormone therapy may lead to plaque destabilization and thrombosis. So what is the role of menopause in the development of cancer? Menopause per se is not associated with increased cancer risk, but because cancer rates increase with age, we recommend screening for the following cancers regularly. For breast cancer, we recommend mammogram every two years, starting age 50. For colorectal cancer, we recommend colonoscopy every 10 years. Or fecal occult blood test, sigmoidoscopy, or barium enema every 5 years, beginning age 50. For endometrial cancer, we recommend evaluation of any postmenopausal bleeding, with pelvic ultrasound or endometrial biopsy. For ovarian cancer, there is no satisfactory screening test, but timely evaluation is needed if the, if the patient presents with bloating, pelvic pain, or urinary urgency. For cervical cancer, we recommend pap test every three years or every five years if combined with HPV test. Screening is not necessary for patients 65 years old and above with three or more normal pap tests in a row, no abnormal pap tests in the past 10 years, or two or more negative HPV tests in the past 10 years. For the initial management of a menopausal woman, we recommend the following. First, is, of course, is lifestyle modification. So we recommend smoking cessation and tell them to limit alcohol intake. The common sense solution will include advising patients to wear comfortable clothing and drink lots of water. We also recommend exercise because this can improve the mood, lower stress, and improve body image. And lastly, we also recommend using weight because this improves uh, vasomotor symptoms. Hormone therapy is a recommended first-line pharmacologic therapy for treating menopausal symptoms. And this encompasses both estrogen alone and estrogen progestogen therapies. So what is the indication for giving estrogen alone or a combined estrogen progestogen therapy? For estrogen therapy, unopposed estrogen is prescribed both as systematically for women who do not have a uterus or locally in very low doses for any woman with vaginal symptoms or vulvovaginal atrophy. For the combined uh, estrogen progestogen therapy, progesterone is added to estrogen to protect the women with uterus against endometrial cancer, which can be caused by estrogen alone. Hormone therapy involves taking estrogen in doses high enough to raise the level of the estrogen in the blood in order to treat hot flashes and other symptoms of menopause. Because estrogen stimulates the lining of the uterus, women with the uterus need to take progesterone to protect the endometrial lining. Women without the uterus can take estrogen alone. If patient only has vaginal dryness, then low doses of estrogen placed directly into the vagina is recommended. No need to take a progestogen when using only low doses of estrogen in the vagina. Chronic unopposed endometrial exposure to estrogen increases the risk for endometrial hyperplasia or cancer. Progestogen prevents endometrial overgrowth and the increased risk of endometrial cancer during estrogen use. Women with an intact uterus using systemic estrogen should receive adequate progestogen unless they are taking conjugated equine estrogen combined with bazidoxifene. These are some of the indications for HRT or hormone replacement therapy. For vasomotor symptoms, HRT is a recommended first-line therapy. HRT is also good for the prevention of bone loss, 
for premature ovarian insufficiency or for those who had surgical menopause, and for patients with genitourinary symptoms of menopause. Here are some of the commonly used hormone preparations. For vasomotor symptoms with intact uterus, you can give conjugated equine estrogen or estradiol valerate combined with medroxyprogesterone acetate. We can also give estradiol hemihydrate plus risperidone. For patients without the uterus, then we can give conjugated equine estrogen alone or estradiol valerate alone. For genitourinary symptoms of menopause, the common Hormone replacement therapy options include estradiol vaginal tablet or estriol cream. You can also give selective estrogen receptor modulator or SERM in the form of ospenifin for patients with genitourinary symptoms of menopause. Here are some of the common menopausal hormone therapy preparations. The locally available hormone replacement therapy options include the following. As for the side effects of hormone replacement therapy, patients may sometimes feel breast tenderness. They may experience vaginal bleeding, nausea and vomiting, headache, weight changes, rash and paritis, and cholecystitis. These are contraindications for menopausal hormone therapy. So if a patient has history of breast or, or endometrial cancer, hormone therapy is contraindicated because this may be exacerbated by the use of hormones. Also included is a history of thromboembolic disease, presence of unexplained vaginal bleeding, active liver disease, acute cardiovascular disease, history of coronary artery disease or stroke, uncontrolled hypertension, active bladder disease, and many more. Again, just to emphasize, for endometrial protection, we give systemic estrogen plus a progestin or progestogen for women with uterus. We can also give conjugated equine estrogen with basidoxyphene. For low-dose vaginal estrogen therapy, then progesterone is not recommended. For osteoporosis management, in addition to lifestyle changes, osteoporosis drug therapy is recommended for postmenopausal women who have had vertebral or hip fracture, postmenopausal women with T-scores less than or equal to negative 2.5, and postmenopausal women with T-scores from negative 1 to negative 2.5 and a 10-year fracture risk of major osteoporotic fracture of at least 20% or of hip fracture of at least 3%. This is the spectrum of treatment for osteoporosis. As you can see here, for early menopause, then the option would be to give hormone replacement therapy or selective estrogen receptor modulator or anoxifin. For those patients who are older or going into late menopause, the options are SERMs, the selective estrogen receptor modulator or anoxifin, and bisphosphonates. For menopausal women of a later age, like late 70s and above, then the options are bisphosphonates and teriparatide. Estrogen has been shown to reduce the risk of osteoporosis as well as to reduce osteoporotic fractures. Serms or selective estrogen receptor modulators such as raloxifen, raloxifen, and tamoxifen have all been shown to decrease bone resorption. Tibolone has also been shown to be effective for osteoporosis. Bisphosphonates in the form of ephedronate, alendronate, resedronate, evandronate, and zoledronic acid are also very effective treatment for osteoporosis, although they may cause osteonecrosis of the jaw, fractures of the long bones such as femur with long-term use. Calcitonin has also been shown to inhibit bone resorption. The use of fluoride increases bone density, whereas parathyroid hormone is also an effective agent to increase bone mass in women with significant osteoporosis. The adjunctive measures for prevention of osteoporosis include calcium at 1,500 mg daily, vitamin D at 400 to 800 IU, and of course, exercise. 
These are the alternatives to hormone therapy. So this includes non-hormonal prescription drugs such as antidepressants, hypnotic drugs, anticonvulsants, antihypertensives, and drugs for neuropathic pain. You also can offer complementary and alternative medicine in the form of traditional Chinese medicine, herbs, and over-the-counter hormones like topical progesterone and melatonin. That's it for my lecture, and thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Inay Rabon, and my WordPress site, Dokino Obigayo. Thank you.